John is really well uh, respected in, in, in the agricultural industry. In particular, he's done about 30 years of work as a private consultant, predominantly in the dairy industry across a range of organisations. And he did spend some time working for, for Murray Goldman in the past as well. And I'm sure if anyone wants to ask any questions in the audience relating to to the recent challenges, there'd be no better man to, to answer those. But today he's, he's here to bring his understanding that he has built across a number of clients across southeast Australia. And his real strength lies in the exposure to that broad clientele. Um, he's regularly uh, exposed to an extensive range of grazing production systems that are expected to cope with ever-changing environmental and economic conditions. This gives him the ability to observe and analyse both the big picture issues as well as those relating to on-farm decision making. And our presentation is all about resilience delivered by John Mulvaney, OMJ Agricultural Consulting. Thank you, John. I'm actually thinking, uh, what am I doing here? Am I in the right spot? I'm a dairy consultant. Um, and I'm feeling like when I went to a, um, a dairy conference in New South Wales about two, three years ago, and there were two or three hundred angry farmers because the price had just gone from 70 cents a litre to 13 cents a litre, and they were trying to cope. And uh, I got talking to someone out here just outside the, the door because my session was after morning tea. And I said to this farmer, I said, how's the conference going? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, he said, all right, he said, but... They bring up these people from Victoria and they haven't got a bloody clue what they're talking about in production systems. So here am I, uh, a dairy consultant, talking to a group of graziers. Um, but I will say that 30 years ago I started in my career um, uh, with a group of prime lamb producers. Uh, that developed a passion for pasture, which I still have. and. Uh, when I walk around paddocks now and you see the residual and you see it coming back and you talk about grazing management, I still find that as motivational as I ever did. Um, I think I've got three messages today, three areas that, that I'm going to cover. One is people and a term it, and you'll know what it means by the time I've finished. The second one is resilience, and I actually feel it should be the other way around. There should be some graziers talking to dairy farmers about resilience. Because um, in my dealing with beef check and beef groups and some sheep groups, if ever I have watched an industry that has manipulated resilience, it's your industry. So I, I think it's... Um, I think you could come and teach dairy farmers a little bit about resilience and manipulation. While I mention resilience, I've got to just uh, pay credit to a group of farmers that I've dealt with for probably 25 years. Um, I'm actually going there today. They're up in northeastern Victoria. They're dryland dairy farmers. Um, you will identify with this description, and the description is um, they have incredibly volatile seasons. They used to be perennial pasture based and now they wonder whether they are, in fact they're not, they sow annuals. Um, and I've watched them for 25 years manipulate their businesses. Um, and they have taught me more about my consulting profession, which I got wrong in the first 10 years and I'll explain that in a minute, um, about resilience, about manipulation, about business profile and I, I always pay due credit to them. The uh, other thing I want to cover is um, the farmer life curve. Everyone in this room, if you've got a pulse, you'll be on the farmer life curve, and I just want you to check that. And, and the last thing is growth when you've got it. So the combination of it and growth is quite powerful, and I want to talk about a few of my clients who've got it and growth. So. Um, it's going to take a while to do that because at my age you tend to ramble a bit. Um, what do I know about your industry? Uh, you'd probably need a magnifying glass to talk about it. Um, I, I, but the principles are exactly the same. From a previous conference uh, in Bendigo probably six months ago, um, this wheel appeared, which I hadn't seen before. And it's essentially farm business wheel, and you will have seen those sort of things around for years. Um, 
And I looked at the wheel and I thought, five out of six spokes are directly related to people. Now, I know you're sitting there worrying, is this bloke going to go into those, one of those warm and fuzzy feelings about hand-holding and, and, you know, it's all about people and it's lovely. Uh, at the end of the day, what amazes me in grazing industries is we can have exactly the same set of resources operated by two different people with two massively different outcomes. So anyone that says to me it's not about people, you're wrong. Um, it. Uh, when I look into the audience, there are people below the age of 30, which is comforting. Um, everyone starts to look young to me. That's depressing, right? Now, when I look at the 30-year-olds or around 30-year-olds in the audience, I think uh, they often say to me, we want to have a crack. We want to have a crack. And I look in their eyes and, and say, if you got it, and they sort of look at me as if, what do you mean by it? Now, everyone in this audience over the age of 50 will know what I mean by it. It's a set of skills that are quite unique, and, and I sit in awe of people with this set of skills. And the set of skills basically lets them manipulate physical resources, financial resources, make complex decisions quickly, and, and other people say, gee, they're lucky. It's not luck, it's that special set of skills. So I look back in the eyes of the 30-year-old, and of course they're all in a hurry, because you know, they, you know, they're a lovely generation, you're a lovely generation, but, but you're in a hurry and you want it now. And I look in their eyes and I say, if you've got it, have a crack. Now, people who've got it, they are unusual. They do look a bit strange at times and they behave, behave even more strangely. Um, and I want to really cover off uh, on what is that skill set. Um, because my, what I always like is when people with it end up in the right position and people without it end up in the right position. But what I hate is people who think they've got it that end up in the wrong position. That's an ugly scene. Uh, just a little bit on benchmarking. I won't ask for a show of hands, there are too many people here, but if I said how many people participate in benchmarking, I'd probably get 15%. Uh, and yet the good book says you should all be benchmarking. And when I started consulting, I thought, oh, it's pretty easy, John. Just go and benchmark them all, tell all the ordinary ones what they're doing wrong, and they'll all change and move into the top 10% and the world will be better. What sort of an arrogance is that? And for any young advisor here in the audience, I'd say, if you are a benchmarking nerd, good luck. You will not be successful in the advisory service. Do I benchmark? Of course I do. Because I like to know what works. And the only way I know what works is if I see people create wealth. And I want to know some physical parameters about what creates that wealth. Otherwise, I'm unsure of my advice. So, yes, I do benchmark. But benchmarking stays in the back of my head, not the front of my head. When I meet clients, new people, um, I like to get in their heads. Because if I can't get in their heads, how in the hell can I provide decent advice? So I watch young, young advisors, and, they're, and I'm probably always the same, uh, little puppy dogs. They're so keen, they're so keen, and they find out what, what's right. You know, what, what are the top 10% doing? So yes, benchmarking is important, but those of you who don't, I'm going to raise the question, how do you measure performance? What's your mark? Because you're not benchmarking, and most of my clients don't benchmark. I force about 60 of them to so I can get the data. It's not that complicated, is it? Are we growing wealth? And are we putting food on the table and having a decent lifestyle? That's why a lot of people don't benchmark, because if they're doing that and educating the kids and all those sort of things, then they're quite comfortable. Now, the reality is, particularly in the grazing industries, is that growth and an adequate standard of living only occur on a minority of farms. Now, that means that there is a challenge there, that if you're benchmarking, if you're... If you're assessment of performance is growth and an adequate standard of living 
and a lot of Australian farms don't achieve that, then we have an issue. So whilst you don't benchmark, I'd raise that as a question, particularly in the grazing industries. So therefore, what I'm saying is investigation is worthwhile. Um, and when you go on the internet, fantastic thing, you know, when you're sitting and you're arguing about something and someone Googles it and you all go to dinner and everyone's on their mobile phones and no one talks to each other, but I won't go there because that's just a grumpy old man <coughs> attitude. Um, when you go on the website and you look for benchmarking programs and data analysis programs, there is no shortage of them. There are hundreds of ratios about your business that most people never look at. And you've got to remind yourselves there are three financial worlds that we live in. And with young clients, I constantly go through these financial worlds. Because the finan financial world called the cash world is what most of my young clients judge their progress by. Now, the cash world is simply, can we pay the bills? And when an industry is under extreme pressure, that is the only thing that is important. Now, I know that in the next 12 months, the dairy industry, um, and you again could probably teach the dairy industry about cash flow management, because some of the tough years I've seen in your industry, you have to be cash savvy. You have to do some budgeting, right? But the cash world is not the growth world. So I actually use a little calculation for any of the 30-year-olds or 40-year-olds in the room. I actually use a little calculation. I call it the fridge calculation when I've got grizzly young clients who are saying, I'm working my butt off for nothing. And I say, let's put our net worth on the fridge today, 1st of July, and this is a good time of the year to talk about this. Put our net worth, assets minus liabilities, whack it on the fridge. We'll come back in 12 months and we'll look at that net worth and if it hasn't gone up, we've either lived really well or we've got to think about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Very simple. The far side is the business efficiency. And when I start talking about EBIT, most of my clients glaze over in their eyes, start snoozing and say, John's having one of those indulgent moments, right? But if we are not profitable, then growth is extremely difficult to achieve. So whilst people say they don't look at that stuff, it is meaningful. Right, business resilience. Um, what is it? In the GFC, I had a lot of clients who absolutely hit the wall. Um, now you are used to this because your product price goes from a lot to nothing in about 24 hours. Now that doesn't happen to dairy farmers so they're not used to it. But what occurred, I sat back and thought there's got to be a combination of a physical profile and a financial profile of a business when we look at businesses. Because what tends to happen is we look at those in isolation. We tend to look at a financial profile and we look at a physical profile, but we don't combine them. And it's the sum total of those that I talk about when I describe my tower and resilience. So what I'm going to do, now it doesn't matter if you're sitting at the back and you can't see what I'm, what's on the blocks, but I just want to build a tower for you. Um, and what I want to, you to picture is bricks in a tower and you're allowed to have a couple out of whack but if you have too many out of whack you either need a bloody good product price or I'd prefer not to do business for you, with you because it'll be too stressful. Right, my first one is cost of production. And when we look at cost of production, there are my, now these are, these are dairy bricks. But my challenge to you is, and I've given a bit of thought to, what are the equivalent grazing bricks? And I don't know that it's a lot different. Um, there's my tower, and I'm going to build that up with some comment now. Cost of production. Now, I'm not talking about just enterprise, because I see a lot of gross margin stuff in the grazing industry saying, my cost of uh, live weight is this for my lambs. Um, 
uh, my cost of uh, producing hay is this. Gross marginal stuff. What I think it's important to know is where do you sit in the scheme of total cost of production per hectare or per whatever you want to quote it because sensible, and let me define sensible. It's easy to have a low cost of production, spend nothing, produce nothing. Good luck with that. You won't progress. You do have to take some risks. But I would like to know where I'm sitting in a volatile industry with cost of production, as long as we talk the same language. So the first one is cost of production. That's just a scatter graph, and we know this stuff. Profit is related to cost of production. Resilience is related to cost of production. I, and I know there, there's a Rabo speaker later, and I won't, I won't mention, I won't say Rabo, but when you, when you listen to Outlook conference stuff, in the dairy industry now, as soon as someone says to me, we're looking good for the next 12 months, I know that there's a horrible downturn about three months away. All right? I, I'm just saying I don't listen anymore because I want to build resilience into my business. And that's what my clients, some of my clients have done. That's why cost of production is important. Cost creep. The fact is the more people get paid, the more they spend. That's human nature. If I go up the coast from Tasmania to Queensland in the dairy industry, the cost of production doubles. What happens with milk price? Doubles. Now you're probably sitting there saying, I wish. I wish I was paid enough that, that I could spend frivolously. Now again, those of you sitting in the audience who've got it will know exactly what that graph means. Because that simple graph is what I've watched for 30 years with very skilled operators who've got it. And that simple graph is simply saying, when is my last unit of input well and truly covered by its cost? Whether it be fertiliser, whether it be re-sowing, whether it be supplementary feeding. Now, the problem with the dairy industry, too many dairy farmers believe that graph is a straight line, which is an economic suicidal pathway. Then, uh, I won't go into the daily optimum position, um, just in case you're having a bit of a snooze. Um, I could talk about cost control, I could talk about a whole range of things, but I couldn't describe it better than that slide. Every one of my clients who has it and has grown high net worth, they're tight. And they always say to me, there's, a, <coughs> there's an expression called <coughs> the TAF factor. And the TAF factor, excuse my language, um, <coughs> which has deteriorated since the milk, the dairy industry imploded, I might add. Um, the TAF factor is the tight ass factor. Now I'm really happy because as I walked through the car park, I looked at the age and the quality of the utes. There's a lot of TAF factor in this room. If that was a dairy car park, quite seriously, there would be too many $50,000 utes. So your industry has a natural TAF factor, right? But obviously, that's what they have to. That, that's exactly right. They have to. Now, so that's cost of production. Now, I'm just going to whack these three together. And they're physical ones. And they're about growing feed. And if there is one characteristic that is going to hold resilience, it's the ability to grow feed and directly harvest it. Because once we start processing the stuff and feeding it back out, we double the cost. And if there is any question, and I heard a conversation as I came in the door before about, um, yeah, I'm not sure whether that perennial is going to survive and uh, whatever. How often have, heard, have I heard that discussion in the last 12 months? Every region I go to is talking about a pasture window that is harder than it used to be. That means that puts pressure 
on the ability to grow feed and directly harvest that. And the moment we lose that focus, cost of production rises, exposure to risk rises. So the most important activity is still growing and consuming direct feed. And they're just three bricks that we could easily convert to grazing. Instead of calling them, we'd call them kilos of dry matter per year or whatever, but they equally apply. If we stock too heavily, the imported feed or supplementary feed will go up. Production per head will go down. Took me 10 years to learn that. I was a stocking rate fanatic when I started. Then we are exposed to risk and our tower starts to get a little bit out of whack and we become tilty. Okay. Let's go to a couple of financial ones. Um, gold bricks are yours, red bricks are the banks, right? Why would you borrow a red brick? Because you can borrow it for and make eight. But the problem is you don't want to borrow it for and make two. So again, I'm happy with red bricks and I'm happy with a lot of red bricks as long as you've got it. If you haven't got it, I don't want too many red bricks. And I certainly don't want you to grow if you haven't got it. Grow with someone else's money. Now, if you're under 30 <coughs> in the audience, you, you will have heard the expression, and I kept on looking over in this corner here, I'm not picking on you, it's just that you look young. Um, have you ever heard the expression, how am I going? Really? Just over half time, God. Uh, have you ever heard the expression, oh, you don't know how hard it is? Geez, we had it harder in our day. And you get sick of it, don't you? You get absolutely sick of it. There's one area that you haven't had it harder, and that is, um, I think, the financial culture. Now, if you think of the financial culture and you say, what's culture got to do with it? Culture drives a lot of stuff. You do not go to a meeting these days without carrying a bottle of water. Does that mean that we're all suffering a kidney disease? No, it just means that culture has dictated that you take a bottle of water to a meeting, otherwise you'll die. <laughs> now that's the power of culture, right? When I was a little boy and I started with clients, we had debt that we paid off. Um, and pre-1980s, I used to love it because you deal with young clients and they might have a livestock loan or a, a tractor loan and you'd rock up to do a visit and they'd say, John, we've cleared the tractor debt. You're a beauty. Let's tick it off. A lot of finance, we had discrete item loans. We didn't have this lumping process all into one debt. Um, and we had limited layers of finance. Now, if you went into the dairy industry, you would be shocked at the levels of finance that a dairy farmer can access. Fertiliser, feed, short-term, long-term, whatever. That wasn't around 30 years ago. And the culture 30 years ago was, there is nothing wrong with killing a red brick Whereas now we tend to say, oh no, that'll be okay, we'll grow the business. Well, you only grow the business if you've got it when you don't reduce debt. We now have what's called all-in-one accounts. They're very convenient, but it's much harder to kill debt as a discrete unit. So what I'm saying is the discipline needed now financially is much greater than 30 years ago. But again, I come back to the Utes, not too many shiny ones, and I actually use uh, the expression, if you're under 30 and you're driving a vehicle that's worth more than your age, you are not serious about asset growth. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> right. Um, sorry. 
I think, again, in terms of debt, there are two, two issues in relation to debt. One is equity, and my brick here is sort of saying, you know, we'd like, we'd like about 60% in the dairy industry, 65% equity. Now, people say to me, but John, are all your clients at 65%? Of course they're not. My young clients are at 38%. 38% equity. How stupid is that? Well, it's not stupid because they've got it. So in other words, if you've got it, you can push debt a lot harder than someone who has not got it. So you see how this it is fairly important. And the last one here, I'll finish off on debt first, um, use of FMDs. Now, my North East clients, 50% of them use FMDs. 10% of my Gippsland clients use FMDs. What's the difference? Are my Gippsland clients nuff-nuffs? No, they're not. They just live in a more reliable area. They're tempted to spend a bit more at times and they need to be less risk aversive, they think. But I don't think so. So my Northeast clients, because they have massive volatility, have a much more conscious approach and deliberate approach to resilience and minimisation of risk. So they use FMDs. And there's a consultant you will have heard of, or, or maybe he, he's the patriarch of the dairy industry consulting, Gibby. And, and Gibby summarised in that paragraph, we know that the range of productivity and profit from the use of similar resources is at least threefold for all data sets. That's a complicated way of saying, when you've got it, you kick bottom. Very simply. Now we call that management skill. Right, my last brick is top 40 management. You only have to be in the top 40%. You don't have to be an Olympian in the dairy industry. Now, you can imagine, think about these. I have a cost of production which is just a tad too high. I am stocked a bit too heavily, and that impacts on my business. I'm a little bit heavily geared. Can you see what the combination of these characteristics is doing? What I need is a bloody good product price to hold that up. That's not resilient. So, that's resilient. My question now is, how long have I got? No, I'll find out. Um, Ten. My question is, how good do I have to be in your industry? In the dairy industry, it's turned in, it's not top 40 anymore, it's top 30. Because there are so many balls to juggle. How good do I have to be in your industry? To, now, I need to context that. To grow wealth. I want to grow wealth. Because this, this generation, one good thing about them is they will not do it for lifestyle, they will not do it for the passion, necessarily. They want some dough. They want to grow wealth, which is a really good focus. How good do I have to be? That's a question. Is anyone out there? Top 20. Okay. As long as you give me an answer, because if I get no answer, we're buggered. Right? So all that saying is that the challenge for the, the young people in this audience is I've got to be top 20. That means that I've got to be able to identify someone who is top 20, doesn't just look like being top 20. Because there's a difference between the perception of a business performance and the actual business performance. I always find it interesting in the dairy industry that some of the prettiest farms are the lowest profit. External perceptions have nothing to do, necessarily, with the generation of profit. They're a bit of a guide at times. So, okay, top 20. So the challenge for you is to say, how's your tower looking? How's your tower looking? And if you want to grow wealth, you need to be in the top 20. So if I was a young person sitting in the audience, I'd think, right, I need to find someone who I know is top 20, making a bucket load of dough or growing wealth, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to watch what they do. I'm going to watch how they make decisions. 
Right, I'll be to get my skates on. So those top people, they amaze me at their ability to take complex issues, simplify them, and make rapid decisions, but not impulsive decisions. There's a difference. And they also go beyond the question of, can I afford it? Because someone, when someone rings me and says, the block next door's come up, we've got to buy it. Yeah. Why? And then I say to them, do you want to answer the question, can I afford it? Or is it a good decision? Now, the people who've got it will go, no, I want to know whether it's a good thing to do. The people who haven't got it will go, no, I just want to know whether I can afford it. Two very different questions. Now, these are profiles of people, a bit like this tower profile. You decide where you fit. Because generally, leopards don't change their spots. We've got a cracker group. Now, they've got it. They tend not to reduce debt because they're so busy, so busy growing that they just keep on growing their business and growing their net worth, but they don't reduce that initial debt. In fact, it might go up. We've got the goods, very steady business performance, um, good business performance, aversion to excessive risk and debt, consolidate and grow. Now, I would say that I've got a lot of clients in that category. And I call them capital pouncers. And the capital pouncer is a steady business. It's got the radar up, doesn't take too much risk, got high equity. And when the industry implodes and capital values drop, they pounce. And they're very good at it because they've got the ability to immediately leverage and pounce. There's nothing wrong with being a steadier or a plotter but I don't want a plotter with too much debt because my tower will be out of whack. And then, of course, every industry has this, their disasters. And the problem is that the disasters often can't see that the, the common element in their disaster is them. And we certainly don't want them expanding. Now, they're not related to farm size in those. OK, I'm just going to jump through a couple of these. In investments, how long have I got? Seven minutes, beautiful. I'm going to jump across. I don't know what your tower is going to look like, but my challenge is I reckon if I had a half an hour with a group of people this afternoon, I'd build the tower. So my challenge is what's the grazing tower look like? And I just, I should have mentioned before, I don't quote some of those parameters in percentage of income. I don't like that. You know, finance as a percentage of income. Because all you need is an increase in product price and everything looks great. It sort of doesn't mean much. I like it in, in um, absolute, so per hectare, per whatever you want, but per something that's not going to change. I think the same issues of per hectare efficiency and animal efficiency. So think about my 38% equity young clients. I do not want them sitting at 38% for very long, otherwise the alligators will bite them on the bum. I want them to move to 40, 50, 60% equity. Right, um, just coming back here. I didn't see too many fancy utes. So that's good. That's good. Um, now, I just want to highlight everyone in this room will be at some stage on this curve and I just want you to think about it. Some of you will still be stuffing around. Yep. Less than five. Okay. Stuffing around. Then you'll hit a period where if you're having a crack and you've got it, you'll be cash poor. And you'll be whinging. What am I doing this for? That's when you need to do the fridge calculation. Then some of you will be right up the top of the curve, high equity, consolidation, 
And the most important thing at that stage is discretionary involvement. You want to move into a position where you can do what you want to do, not what you have to do. And if another opportunity comes up that impinges on your discretionary involvement in your business, be very cautious about taking it because it might restrict you at a stage of life where you should have no restrictions. Okay, these are, just to finish off on, these are four businesses that I've dealt with, that I deal with. And the combination of it, it, and growth can be ex exponential. But the difficulty is what do we do with scale? And one thing I'm sure of is the economies of scale that I thought existed in agriculture, particularly in my industry, don't exist beyond a certain point. Because it's people that generate the profit. Now in each of the cases here, so top left hand corner are the Valences and Nevilles, who are clients of mine, own dairy farms in Western Victoria, bought a dairy farm in Northern Victoria, Tash on the right hand side of them and uh, Joe, young managers with it. Now immediately the Valences and Neville said, right, they've got it. We have to share our wealth creation with them, which is what they've done, equity partnership. The ones below, a corporate, the only corporate I deal with, AgCap, sustainable ag. They've got five dairies in Tasmania. Their share farmers are not just paid wages equivalent. We make sure they are creating wealth because they're creating wealth for the company. Top right hand corner, terrific example of a grazier who loved grazing but lived in Gippsland. Land is too expensive. David and Penny went to Flinders Island. They've now got, I think, three or 4,000 breeders. They've still got a dairy farm in Gippsland. And Ewan, on the right-hand side, shares in the wealth creation of the dairy farm. Bottom, Ian Alice Holloway from Northern Victoria, Northeastern Victoria. And again, uh, restricted by capital base, so they don't own dairy farms, they rent them. The dairy they're standing in front of is built on someone else's land. Everyone thought they had rocks in their heads. We can depreciate that off over a 10 year lease and they're still making really good dough. So this is the combination of someone with it, who's a bit of a tight ass, who thinks outside the square, that's an exponential effect in agriculture. And you see that in your industry as well. So they're just very good examples. So the message is, resilience and growth in farming are driven by profit, wise use of profit, and a sacrifice in lifestyle at the right age. Now, if you do that, and you've seen people do that, there are still opportunities there. Thanks. We'll just take this one. Thanks. Ken Solly. John, with uh, Baby Boomers Generation X, Y and Z being clearly defined individual groups, how do you as a consultant go about breaking the deadlock between the younger generation with higher levels of motivation, education, vision maybe, and preparedness to take risk with the older generation who want to be more conservative and take less risk? What do you do to help to keep both generations arrive at an optimum outcome? Yeah, um, that's probably 80% of my work now, funnily enough, is the succession side and that intergenerational. And it's interesting, 30-year-olds that, that I deal with now have a quarter of the assets and a quarter of the net worth that 30-year-olds I dealt with 15 years ago. So it's actually, it's actually even more polarised in wealth now. What we've got to do, and, the, and, and I use, there's about five components to that process. Um, you know, respect, communication, you will have heard all of those. But I, I think it's making sure that each party knows that if nothing changes, 
we're just constipated. So, so what occurs is if the older generation are so conservative that, that we can't move, then this generation will actually leave that business, which may not necessarily be what this generation wants. So there's a whole lot of issues in there, but um, I, I think it's, it's very much making both generations aware of, of the shortcomings of their position. Energy, energy poor, asset rich. Energy rich, rich, asset poor. Very good combination to get together as long as we respect and we take the process slowly. So whenever I set up any succession paths, we bite off small chunks to see how we like getting in bed together. <coughs> oh, round of applause. Oh, really quick, as long as you got a quick response, John. It'll be quick. Got to be real quick. Just a very quick question was, uh, when you're looking at your crackers, you were using a 14% return on equity, and I'm curious to see why you use return on equity rather than return on assets managed. Ah, because, yeah, oh, quick one, quick, quick. It's got to no, be real quick. Quick, quick. Because, because essentially, I'm renting my red brick off, the, off Rabo, right? So after I've paid Rabo for the rental, the most motivational figure you can ever have, particularly with young, highly geared people, is having paid the bank for the money, what am I doing on my asset? And that's why when you deal with people who are crackers, when you see return on equities of 14 20%, they go, oh, my God, how good is that? So it's motivation. Okay. Thanks very much, Sean.